So hello and welcome to the 27th episode of the Borhat Tavern Podcast, a podcast all about Seven Deadly Sins Grand Cross. So I'm your host, Daz, and today with me is just Sandy, because Novage couldn't make it again. What? Where, where's Novage? What's, what's happening, Sandy? Last I heard from him, he was like deathly sick, so I guess uh, we're, we're, we're quarantining him from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's I can't believe, like... He missed one episode last year. I was like, that's never going to happen again. And now we're two weeks in a row with no Novage. So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of enjoying doing it with just you. Maybe, maybe we'll have to boot Novage off the show. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Let us know in the comments, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm at work today. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching if you're watching this in video form, you'll notice that saying he's got a phone because she had a call into the Zoom call today. So uh, she, she's looking very businessy. Uh, any, anyhow. We do have a great show today. We've got a few things we want to talk about and cover in particular. The first thing we're going to talk about is Cusack. He's the new festival unit that just got released this week. And then uh, JP actually had a little bit of news come out. Uh, Ocean Empress Easton. So a new named Easton with new cosmetics and everything. And uh, new green mono. Not new cosmetics. Just an old, another variant of the existing mono. Also got released today on JP. So we're going to talk about them both a bit. And hopefully... Fingers crossed we've got some time because uh, we've both got some engagements after uh, the show. But if we don't go too long, we're also going to talk about Holy Relics because there's a bit of controversy uh, surrounding the Holy Relic system and just how that's been handled by Netmarble. So we just wanted to kind of touch on that. Uh, no game today because it doesn't really work when you only have one person, one contestant. Maybe we'll have to try and figure out some some games that only, that work well with one person. I guess you can do like 20 questions or something. But anyways, we don't have one prepped for this week. But if Nova doesn't make it next week, we'll have a game prepped for next week, I promise. Okay. So starting with the first thing we want to talk about, Dual Swordsman Cusack. He's a brand spanking new blue unit. Uh, We talked about him a little bit last episode, but just briefly. So we're going to go into the details here. He's got a passive, which makes him him. If a critical strike does not occur when a demon ally uses a single target still on the enemy, inflicts damage equal to 40% of the enemy's increased max HP in PvP. And this activates only when entering battle, so it only works in the front line. So just a little bit of explanation about that. So increased max HP means that if they've got any sort of passive buffs or active buffs on them that increase their HP above what of what above what their baseline would generally be, you get to do 40% of that extra increased HP as bonus damage. So it only really works as a passive against characters that do have some sort of buff, be it passive or active, on them actively, increasing their HP. His first skill, it inflicts cleave damage, which does not activate crit critting, and it equals 200, 300, or 500% of the attack on one enemy. So what cleave does is it does additional damage based on your crit damage. So it's like critting without critting. It's kind of, in my head, the way I think about it is he's actually kind of critting. It doesn't say crit, but it does about crit damage level numbers. So it's kind of like a weird workaround on that. His second skill inflicts damage equal to 120 up to 450% of attack on one enemy and depletes one ultimate move gauge orb and that goes up to three gold orbs on gold. His ultimate is a power strike ultimate and the one thing that kind of makes it different than any other kind of power strike card or, or a lot of ultimates is that it does have a power jump at three when you have three six um, alt and when you have five six alt when you get past three six alt you get 25 percent abyss damage once you get past five six alt you get 50 percent abyss damage anything below three you don't get any abyss at all abyss is what king festival king has where at the beginning of the enemy's turn you do additional damage to all enemies it's pretty cool it makes his single target ultimate into kind of an aoe ultimate so big power spike there if you happen to get a few copies of the guy Okay, that was a mouthful. Sandy, what do you think about this guy? I don't know. Just reading his kit, he's just made to counter Bon. You know, like, I, I mean, his passive is really strong against, like, the characters, like you said, that have the passive HP boost or, you know, any of the, uh, what's it called, blue, what are, what, uh, I'm blanking out, Daz, help me out. What is it? The blue buff? That, <laughs> there we go. Oh, blue just the buff. buff. Yeah, I was like, I have no idea where you're going with this, Sandy. You have to help <laughs> me out. 
I know, but you know, he's really strong against Bon. Um, okay against T one or Margaret, but I don't I don't really know if he kind of suits into the meta right now because Margaret can counter Bon and can can counter Assault Meliodas. So it's it's a very niche character um, to have his passive work against those HP buffs, and in order for him to kind of do you know what he's meant to do. Um, I mean, his ultimate is cool, Daz. The Abyss is nice, but it's kind of like Netmarble saying, yeah, you got to pull a couple times in order for him to even be useful. Yeah, well, considering that most people are probably going to be skipping this banner, like not a lot of people are going to be pulling hard on it anyways, right? And you do need to you know, either get lucky on a full 900 gem rotation if you want to get three, get them to three six. I guess you get, you get one for free. I guess I should mention that too. You do get a free cop, not copy of the unit, but a free coin of the unit if you have him, if you do your growth event quests. So really you only need them two six on a full rotation, but that still requires some luck in order to get that abyss uh, damage out of there, out of him. But yeah, anytime you say niche on a unit, I, I don't, I don't like it <laughs> um, <laughs> because those characters are very, very, very dependent on the situation in meta that being said like ungeared guild wars it could come in handy when you're trying to crack certain teams i don't know is there anything to that maybe um i think so but then i can't really find any other um i guess pve sort of area that he could suit into i know we were talking about what using him on red demon but even then like his passive doesn't do anything so he's just another character in your box yeah, well, exactly. Like his passive is exclusively for PvP as well. So that's strictly PvP. And I guess Guild Wars content counts as PvP as well. But yeah, like I, I run with my regular demon party. He has Cusack and he tried him in Red Demon and he did okay. But like the, the new Merlin's better. Eleven's better too if you have her just as a secondary damage there. T1 is obviously better. Like he's like, you know, the, the, de facto best dps against the red demon um but i mean if you have him and you want to just try out something new in red demon you could use him but he's not necessarily the greatest and again his passive doesn't do anything not sure if it even would because the red demon probably doesn't have additional hp but who knows um he does like like you said too do okay against some other units in the meta right now like margaret's and t1s but he was really built for bond so like we're not seeing a lot of bond in the meta right now. Maybe that'll change. I guess now that we have holy relics coming out around the corner. But um, that being said, like having a unit specifically to counter like one particular team, it's tough to justify running that unless like ninety percent of the teams you see in PvP are that team that you're trying to counter. Because if not, like anytime you go up against a team that isn't you're the one that you're trying to counter if if that's like a losing matchup it's probably better just to have a team that's just generally better you know your glue eaters your bond teams your unknown teams your margaret teams there's a lot of different options that i'd rather take into pvp as opposed to cusack i feel like they should have um, released cusack during the bond meta when you know all we saw in pvp were just bonds and you know arthur's so maybe Cusack should have came before Margaret and, you know, Netmarble doing it the other way around. It, it really does make the banner totally skippable. Yeah, a little too little too late. I guess they <laughs> probably realized what happened when they had when they released Bond and how OP he was. And they're like, oh, we need to come up with a counter unit. But we've already planned, you know, Margaret and whatever units are in between now, uh, now when we had Bond. And then they're like, okay, well, we'll release him then. And then by that time, he's already out of the meta. So I guess that's the problem with, <laughs> you know, trying to pivot. Because I can't, I, I I imagine that Cusack probably was a little bit different when they per, first brought him to the table, uh, as opposed to his final form that he came in now. Because they probably scrambled to get some sort of bond counter out. But turns out Margaret does a pretty good job of that, and the unknown teams. But that's a different story. So what what do you uh, think gear best gear is on this guy? Is, do you think we were we talking support? E type unit for maybe your Festival Zeldris because his passive does work for Festival Zeldris as well, or is he just more of like a damagey dealer type? Sandy, what do you think? Nah, I feel like he's just a support unit. And um, uh, looking at like just his stats and what his skill cards are, I would say like attack crit on him would be the best. Um, not so sure about the sub stats because like 
do uh, depending on what team you put him on, right? Whether you pair him up with the Festival Zeldris or if you're going to do kind of like a mix with, you know, a Chandler droll, um, like a demon team. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like attack crit is a safer bet just because of his one uh, skill um, that, you know, the first skill activating the crit damage. So technically you crit, but you don't crit. So additional damage. What do you think, Des? Yeah, well, he, he can do a lot of damage. Like if against spawns, obviously it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but uh, he doesn't do like T1 level damage or anything. But still, like if, if you're bringing him as a DPS, I think you do need to make sure you go all in attack crit. And it really, he really does feel like uh, he does need that crit set in order to really shine. And if you're trying to maximize damage, attack crit's the way to go. Um, at least that's my thoughts on it. Uh, I guess, yeah, you could technically maybe take him in more as like a support for a Zeldris and folks with the Zeldris on the DPS side of things. But I don't know if that's necessarily the way you want to go. Even if, if you do run Festival Zeldris and Cusack, you probably want them both on attack. And and yeah, I guess they'll be a bit glass cannony, but you, that's kind of their job, right? Is to take out units hard and fast. All right. Well, anything else we want to say about this guy? Or is he just... Does he just sack? Cusack sacks, right? <laughs> yeah, we could, we could sack him. Get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have some people that are a kind of excited for him in a little bit, just for, for Guild Wars defense. I figure putting him with Festival Zeldris with Keo on like an Ignite team would be a really good combination because Keo's Ignites give Zeldris' passive a lot of boost. And then you've got Cusack boosting Zeldris and himself, obviously, against potential HP increasing units that come along uh, on attack. So I don't know, maybe there's something to that. I guess we'll see uh, in the next season of both geared and ungeared Guild Wars. That sounds really interesting because then you can put what Monspeed in there too. So you're kind of yeah. running a demon team with a Keo. <laughs> yeah, and Monspeed's not a big critter as well. So, hey, that might we might just have crafted the ultimate defense <laughs> right there. So um yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I know a lot of people use that kind of combination, but instead of Cusack, they use Chandler um, just to give it a little bit of the, you know, taunty, taunty, hard to deal with kind of business. And then also Chandler's probably just a better unit in general than Cusack, especially like more, like I said, more generally less niche as well. Okay, let's move along to the next topic. We've got Ocean Empress Easton. She's a red unit. She has fancy news cosmetics look pretty look pretty sick. But that being said, I don't want to spend more gems on cosmetics for new characters. I want the old cosmetics I've already got maxed out to work because it's a lot of either gems or money to 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 deck out a new character in these cosmetics. What what do you like? Do you have any thoughts about like I know there's the cool cosmetic side of things, but whenever they have these new named units, it leaves a little sour taste in my mouth. Like, how about you, how about you, Sandy? Like, give us new cosmetics. That's cool. Like, give us three three pairs of new cosmetics for Easton, but just make them for all of the Eastons. Why does it have to be just for this one? I know. And I mean, we already have a red Easton, so dang, like, can you at least give us that to share with the other red Easton? <laughs> I just think it's a, it's a new form of just net marble trying to milk the player base, you know, um, but we can talk about that later with the Holy Relic, but yeah, I do not like new cosmetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's unfortunate again we'll talk about that net marble situation with you know milking the player base i guess after we talk about easton and mono too but yeah it, it hurts a little bit but either way let's let's just ignore that for now and we'll just talk about the character because she does have some neat things going on for her it seems with uh, this new Easton and the new Mono, Netmarble's trying to set the stage for a Seven Catastrophes team. Both their passives work better the more Seven Catastrophes you have on the team. And we'll go over them kind of individually and then we'll talk about them as a whole, I guess, and, and maybe the, the how they could work well together. This is we're done going over both of them in detail. So... Easton has a few things. Her passive is what makes her interesting. For every seven catastrophe on the team takes 3% less damage for every orb in the battle. So she's about damage mitigation, very much like uh, the red Lizhawk that we just got 
a few weeks ago. Like we're seeing more of these new damage mitigation units. And whenever you have a team in PvP, I feel like damage mitigation is very important or survivability is really important. Like it's it's a similar role to like what a tank would do or what uh, like Goddess Liz would provide with her death protection. You want to be, be able to make sure you can survive the first few turns to be able to do what you can do. And I th- a pass like this can potentially make it worthwhile and, and actually able like you able to do this kind of functionality. Um, just doing a little bit of math too. So in 3v3, 4v4, she's even better because there's more orbs on the table, but there's 30 orbs total that you can have full, right? 15 on each side, assuming everyone's still alive. 4v4, there's 40 orbs. But doing the math, if half of them are full, which I mean, at the beginning, they won't all be half full, but you think generally you'll have about half the orbs full. That's 45% damage reduction to all the seven catastrophes on the table. And 45% is significant. Uh, That obviously goes up. Uh, as more orbs get full and you want to try and maintain both sides of the, you know, your enemies as well as your allies with as many orbs as possible to increase this damage mitigation. But you can actually get over 100% damage mitigation in 4v4. I'd love to see some gameplay footage of that. Unfortunately, I don't have a JP account. Maybe we can get, get Novich to pull on the banner or something and show us how how it works. But I can't, over, can you imagine like patiencing alts i imagine that's what would happen i don't think there's anything like if you've got enough alt orbs on both sides like all you need is like 33 of them right and that's basically 100 uh, percent. other than her passive which is cool and i guess i've been going on a little bit about that for a bit she's also got a um an ultimate move, move depletion single target card which is very similar if not exactly the same to like green merlin or any so many of these like a cusack i think's got one too just the single target depletion card um but she's got a new card, which we've never seen before. It's an AOE rank down card, but it's delayed. So she does an AOE attack and anyone does damage to gets a debuff on them. So at the end of their turn, their next turn, they'll get all of their cards ranked down by one level. Uh, the only problem is it's, it's delayed. So there's obvious counter play to that. I don't know. Do you, this card feels a bit weird. Does it feel a bit weird to you too, Sandy? Yeah, I mean, like, her whole kit, uh, I I see what they're trying to do, you know, with the whole seven catastrophes, but then you've got her passive, which is interesting, but then one of her skills is the alt depletion, which is a strange choice, because, right, the passive, you, (laughs) I mean, one of the cards is that you you want all the orbs on the field. Um, We were talking about it earlier, about having an alt lock would probably have made more sense for this Easton, but... um, I don't know. Alt lock, it's a weaker card in general, but an alt deplete is nice to have. Like maybe this red Easton could have healed like the other red Easton. Then she would have been uh, a little bit more, I would say, a needed unit. Yeah, like definitely like a heal card or another support card I think would be pretty good. She's obviously a support unit or even just like a rank down like that just ranks down like you what what's the need for the debuff to wait the extra turn because you can cleanse it you just the other team can play those silver and gold cards to avoid the rank down like it's a very easy thing to rank to to work around um but yeah like it's it's i think it's going to be an interesting like balancing act when you play with her on your team because you want the enemy team to have orbs but you kind of don't want them to have orbs too because that means that they're getting close to alt so yeah like alt lock i think would have been <laughs> kind of the perfect idea of course that's cleansable so um the sing- the alt depletion makes it a little bit easier to control that fine line that you need to 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 kind of deal with but um yeah she'll she'll be a fun one and a difficult one i think Uh, and those are always the fun characters once you gotta think a little bit about there's no glue eaters here right you actually have to put a little thought process into to using your east and and maintaining that balancing act of all orbs but uh yeah i think think... sorry do i think (laughs) well i was saying i think and you said do you think so i'm curious to see if what you think i think (laughs) is what i think you think is i i I I just lost are you thinking what i'm thinking i don't know am i thinking (laughs) what you're thinking i'm thinking let's find out what are you going to say sandy no i was just thinking because uh you know uh you were talking about the 4v4 like this could this be in replacement or in addition to, because we've got what angel teams, we've got demon teams, right? And now it's a seven catastrophe team. So, I mean, she could be really good. Um, 
I don't know whether we talk about defense just yet or maybe an attack team um, for Guild Wars, ungeared. Uh, but she she is interesting. And I think if people really don't know how she works, again, you said you kind of have to put thought into it if you're going to be taking her out on the field or if you're playing against her, right? Yeah, and I do think that one of the problems with trying to craft uh, seven catastrophes team is you've got a limited pool of units to choose from. Um, and for for teams like Demon, there's lots of demons now. For angels, a lot of the angels are really strong. A lot of the catastrophes, like I don't think there's any like really strong ones, which al- almost maybe makes a reason to to say like, okay, well maybe they're not strong, but if you have passives that can piggyback on, off each other, you can make them stronger. Um, but still, it's, I think I think it's hard to like f- look at the existing set of seven catastrophes and find that OP team out of what cards we have to play or, or characters we have to put on the table. But I really think they're just like stacking or setting the the scene to add a new catastrophe or two, which will really take this one over the top and make it maybe a meta team going forward, which will be cool. Um, one thing that kind of adds on to this is like just even just the the new mono which i guess we'll just talk we can talk about now because when we're talking about seven catastrophes team like she also plays into this discussion as well because she gets a lot of additional power based on the fact that she's playing with the seven catastrophes so let's go over her kit now and then maybe we can continue that conversation we're having because i think that is like the large overarching conversation about these seven catastrophe units is like are these teams going to be viable so her passive is unlike easton's easton's is any seven catastrophes gets damage mitigation based on her passive mono she only gets her passive to activate if everyone on the team is a seven catastrophes unit. It's kind of like Assault Meliodas and that he needs like demons or commandments on the team. Mono needs all of them to be seven catastrophes or else her passive just doesn't have any effect. So the way her passive works is if all allies are seven catastrophes, Mono gets 3% all stats. So it's not just your basic stats, it's all stats up whenever attacked with an attack skill. If this sounds familiar, there's a reason for that. Mikasa from way back when attack on titan collab that you never see anywhere she has the exact same passive obviously it doesn't have the condition for the seven catastrophes but mikasa was actually pretty strong and she but she just takes a little while to ramp up but after a few turns of getting attacked especially if you get attacked with the aoe card so she's constantly getting attacked 30 percent all stats boost is pretty significant she her her first and second skill are all damage too that's what she is she's a damage dealer she's got crit chance that's base 80 percent. that's not like super awakened or cosmetics as soon as you put super awakening and cosmetics in her she's well over 100 percent crit chance which is crazy and then not to mention she can get 30 percent more from her passive not to mention any other sort of you know ways of getting it as well through buffs and passives but she also has amazing lifesteal too. She's a bit of a glass cannon. So usually you want a little bit of lifesteal in these characters. She's got 25, 20% base lifesteal. It goes up to over 35% though with SA and cosmetics as well. So she can get a lot of that life back after she hits. Her kit is very crit based. Uh, She's got a spike card, which does double the crit damage uh, on a successful crit on her first skill, which... That, that's the good old blue Zelda's card, right? You got to hope she crits. I mean, she's got a lot more crit chance than Zelda's does. And then she's got an AOE card for her second skill, which is the exact same as Sariel's AOE card, which is Sever card, which we know hits hard. So what are your thoughts on Mono? She sounds like a pretty cool unit, but again, there's that caveat. She's got to be on a Catastrophes team to work. I'm I, I kind of like this whole catastrophe setup that they're um, putting it up. Sorry, as you were talking, I was just thinking of like all the seven catastrophe characters. And, you know, with the red Easton and then this green mono where their passives can work with each other. Um, I mean, if you throw in like Valenti, <laughs> uh, that would be pretty, pretty tanky because you were just saying like, you know, we're not really seeing someone use the um, the mono just yet, you know, in any YouTube showcase, um, we've seen the red Easton and things like that, but 
she she is a lot better than Zeldris. I will say that for sure because Zeldris' crit is just so unpredictable. And I think if you build her kit correctly, like her equipment, um, she could be a pretty tanky character. And I mean, she has a, a holy relic too, right, Daz? That's coming out. Yeah, and the holy relic that got released on JP with the the release of the new unit it is pretty insane. Uh, the, the way that it reads is anytime that she does a crit on an enemy unit, they get a 20% max HP corrosion. So that's like a gold Blue Demelio's corrosion card, right? Just for free, um, which is nuts. Because not only are you doing a lot of damage, but 20% max HP, not remaining HP, max HP corrosion can get a lot of work done if you can't cleanse that thing off. So I, I can see mono being kind of like the core dps unit of course she's green which can be good because there's a lot of blue units in the meta now and who knows again like i said i'm not sure if there's like quite a meta team for the catastrophes catastrophes yet but maybe there's something around the corner i feel like there's a third piece to this puzzle sandy that we need maybe a tank shin or something i don't know or a heal well hey maybe even like <laughs> evil lilia with her with her um holy relic could work because she um provides a little bit of healing with one of her attack cards but then also like her holy relic is pretty impressive too i think it adds uh like 10 percent stats basic stats for every uh debuff on the enemy team so you, you can put those three together hey maybe that'll be a, a combo or like you said valenti or maybe an mk2 valenti i don't know the options are endless well actually they're not endless there's only a few of them that you can really go with but still i think it, it'd be interesting to see what people come up with over the next couple of weeks yeah, down the road. I'm kind of looking forward to it. If they're going to set this up correctly, like they got to release something else that kind of glues it all together. Yeah. I do think they've got a good foundation with Mono and Easton together because Easton's kind of like that stall unit because you want to, you know, get the alt orbs up to get the damage mitigation going and then mono wants you to stall to uh to get her passive going and then you just unleash hell. So, it'll be interesting to see how this hell gets unleashed with uh, potentially new units down the road. Okay, so we definitely have time to talk about Holy Relics too. Um, maybe I'll set the table a little bit because I, I know not everybody necessarily knows the whole story with um, what Netmarble has been doing recently and the kind of community outcry that's been going on. So there's been a lot of recent controversy around Netmarble trying to like milk the player base for as much revenue as possible. Netmar it's no surprise like Netmarble the game's been around for a year and a half now, two years on JP, right? So sales have slowly been dipping, dipping as Netmarble's been kind of screwing the player base over here and there. Uh and with revenue dips comes probably a lot of pressure from the upper brass to try and make more revenue. And that's tends to be a pretty bad cycle to get into because you know the more you're trying to milk a player base the more the player base resents it the more people end up probably leaving whereas you can focus more on gamer experience maybe and give the game a bit more longevity but i think what the problem is people are seeing this almost desperation from netmarble which is um causing a lot of strife in the community so this i mean i'm gonna say this all started but Really, it started back on the first episode of this podcast, dude, with like Assault Meliodas being released early. But um, more recently, uh, this kind of started to snowball when they announced back to back festival banners with Margaret and Cusack. Now, when that was first announced, we're going to get back to back banners. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's like so many gems, two OP units back to back. Turns out Cusack wasn't really OP. So it, it, it dulled down the concern a little bit because everyone's like okay well it's a festival banner yes but it's a skippable one so we won't worry too much about that i think netmarble got like a little bit of a pass from the player base on that um but then uh, a couple weeks later they released holy relics on jp they're not in global yet and holy relics look pretty cool they're like an, a weapon that you can give we, we've kind of been talking about them during the show i just realized we haven't really explained what they are they're a new weapon that you'll be able to equip to characters they're unique specifically to that character so you'll have one for like the one or you'll have one for for easton for instance and it gives a special uh, ability like the one we mentioned about uh, mono is that you know you get anytime you crit 
they you get yeah they add a twenty percent max HP debuff. Like they're pretty powerful effects they come along with, and as you can expect, they're not the simplest things to get. There aren't a ton of them yet. I think there's like eight to ten that are currently released on JP. There's only like maybe four that were released on release of relics, but they released another set of them just this week. Um, so they're really hard to get. The way you get them is you got to grind this new stage, which is like this like bird looking demon thing. And it's hard content. Like it's been out for, I don't know, almost four weeks, I guess on JP now. And just last week is the first time someone could beat like the hardest difficulty. Basically it's, it's a staged event. So you've got to go through like different stages, but no one had gotten past the final stage yet until just last week. Someone posted on Twitter. I think that they actually passed it and it required a lot of RNG a lot of like whaled out units, like essentially like it's going to be next to impossible, uh, at least in, for the foreseeable future. So most people can only get to a certain level, like the second, the second highest stage uh, or even like not even that far too. Cause even that requires a lot of whale units, really maxed out stats, very specific units like Sariel, for instance, is a really big one there. Um, so generally most people are going to get like one of these pieces that you need each week because it's kind of like um training cave it's it's time gated so you can only do it so many times per uh per amount of time uh so if you only get one of these things per week you need 15 to get a relic it's going to take 15 weeks to get a holy relic yeah if you can beat the second highest stage that goes a bit quicker and if you get that like crazy rng you can do the, the highest stage the highest phase you can complete that it's a little bit quicker um but still, it's going to take a while, which is which is fine too. Like it's not there's nothing wrong with making it really difficult to get these like crazy weapons. Like it'll, it'll feel like a real big achievement when you get this like really cool OP weapon for your unit, I, and there would be a big sense of accomplishment. The biggest problem is that they released packages that you can purchase for real dollars, where you can basically skip this line. And like we know that like okay. The, the pay to play whales are the ones that keep the lights on at Netmarble. And it's okay to like have some sort of way to do it, but not just completely skip, you know, f six to 15 weeks of grinding just to like get those crazy weapons. And yeah, you can't buy, uh, I think it's like one or two per month you can only buy, but still that's significant advancement in the game. And in order to keep things healthy, you need to make sure that you have a good balance between the pay to win and the free to play experience. And I think this is where that's kind of diverged a little bit and it's gotten the player base up in arms. You know, I don't know if people are making too big of a deal about this or if, if it's like right on the nose, if they're not making enough of an outcry, if we should be giving that marble a pass on it because they need to make money too. I am interested to hear what Sandy has to say because I've been talking for a long time straight without listening to what Sandy has to say. So Sandy, what do you think about this holy relic situation now that I've set the table? Well, for one, yes, they are super cool. I mean, think of it as like engraved weapons, right? You are weapons made specifically um, for each character. I, I think that's a nice facet to it. But this really is kind of like end game for those whales, for the play to win uh, pay <laughs> to win characters um, or whales of the community because you kind of get this this edge that a lot of free to play characters or even um, people who are new, you know, to the game, that these people are just so OP. I mean, I can only imagine someone who's free to play going into PvP and you go against someone who just has all these weapons because, uh, I mean, they can just buy the bundles. I don't think that fair of net marble again it's a balance act right it's great for those who can afford to you know uh, continue playing this game but for those of us who are the budget spenders or those of us who play for the content the content's good but i have to pay for it and to make it to make it so grindy heavy it's annoying like we can't even grind it. So 15 weeks. Oh my gosh. I mean, we're on episode 27, right? So 27 weeks of, of what? Of the podcast. So you got to go 15 weeks in order to like make these weapons. It just doesn't make sense, that marble. Yeah. And I think we'll probably get a unit, hopefully very soon, which will make this bird demon a lot easier to, to, to do or to run. Um, but barring that... I, I do think what 
they need to do is make these materials, like maybe the drop rate a little bit higher or a little bit more accessible, maybe uh, make it so you can do more runs per week, just some way to kind of speed it up because from 15 weeks to being able to skip it and get things on pretty much day one, I think that's where the biggest problem is. Like if, if it was, you can get a Holy Relic every like five weeks, or maybe if you could only buy a third of the way there with these bundles, like that'd be a bit different. It's just the disparity is so large. I think that's what the biggest problem is. Um, but that being said, like there are some pretty cool weapons and I think this is something to be excited about. I, I, I kind of was when I first heard about it. I mean, it puts a sour taste in your mouth when you find out about the paid bundles, but like they're, they're like new cosmetics, like uh, bonds. He gets like the Shang-Chi, rings around his wrists right and he like looks just like so badass having those on like the fact that they added cosmetics into this to makes it pretty cool in my opinion is there any one like weapon or maybe a few weapons that like really have caught your interest sandy i i've got a couple that i'm interested to see and like i'm kind of eyeing down but i'm I'm curious which ones you like or which ones you've got an idea to get it I know. I, I kind of like that you said that, you know, it does leave a sour taste in your mouth. Um, I kind of think of Net Marble like Sour Patch Kids. <laughs> it's like first they're sour and then they're like sweet because Purgatory Bond basically, like you said, gets the Shang-Chi, Shang-Chi like rings. And then his weapon is like whenever an ally dies, increases the hero's max HP by 15%. And it's kind of like, that's what Bond was built for with the HP boost. So even if Arthur dies or Twee God dies, he still gets an HP boost. <laughs> he's a really cool one and then jesus way to make the one even more uh tanky and just do more damage you know his weapon i'm really excited about i know it doesn't do a lot but ignores 30 percent of enemies defense when using skills in pvp and it applies before the skill activation uh every little bit counts because you know sometimes your t1 is just like that close to killing a bond or someone so i really think that weapon is awesome but there's other characters in here that i just i, I mean when do we use them like twee god gets one that marvel was like don't don't forget about twee god what are you excited for dev yeah well first i just want to mention too because you brought up a good point it's kind of want to elaborate on a little bit too the one escanor like 30 percent uh reduced defense on the enemy when you attack them like a lot of people i've, I've seen in reddit and everything i was like oh 30 like that's gonna be so much more damage defense does mitigate damage but not as much as you think uh for if this was 30 percent defense related stats that'd be a different situation because you'd be reducing crit resistance which would be huge and crit defense which would also be huge but um like you're not going to be getting 30 percent more damage out of Ascanor. uh by attacking with three, to an enemy with 30% less defense. So just something to keep in mind, especially when people are flaming this idea on Reddit and thinking it's like super OP. I actually think it's one of like the weak, it's cool. And I'm, it's probably the one I'm going to get first of on this list. But um, that being said, it's not as OP. I think, so I think people are making it out to be. Yeah, Twigo's is pretty cool. Um, I, I, I really like Monos. I, I, I know we talked about it before and it's like a bit of a, disappointment to like bring on one we've already talked about but the fact that you can get a 20 percent max hp corrosion every time you hit i'm assuming they're not stackable but still like she's got an aoe card like that that's that's nuts so you can do can you imagine sariel's aoe with a 20 percent corrosion debuff on it oh my gosh that just screams to me like panic if you're on the enemy team and i like to make other people panic sandy that's that's kind of that's kind of a fun thing to do right um but i know we're gonna see a ton more relics like if they've already released was this like 10 i think we've got already within a few weeks of them being released like we're gonna be getting these for every character probably within like a few months so i'm curious to see what ones we're gonna be seeing down the road like margaret's goddess liz ah what else could you give goddess liz right oh my goodness i guess we'll find out <laughs> give her new wings or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's true i guess like some units they don't really like use weapons necessarily too but i guess they don't have to be weapons because like purgatory bond like mentioned is like the rings around his wrists right so it's just more like some sort of like additional bit to their cosmetics okay should we just jump into the featured comment sandy 
Yes, absolutely. So every week, of course, we do a featured comment wherever you leave it for us, you know, Discord, um, wherever you find us on our podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. But the majority of our comments always come from YouTube. And this week comes from one of our loyal listeners or even watchers, Kaliga Relinquo. And he says, still going strong, I see. Please keep this going. I need these podcasts to get me through the week. By the way, which collabs would you like to see in game? I think that's for you, Daz. What which collab? Well, I think what most people probably say is the the leaf slime collab that we know is coming out sometime down the road. There's a new slime game coming out to Gacha game this year, so I guess they're trying to maybe time it with that. I don't know. Um, but I'm gonna go off book. A lot of people would probably say, you know, like all oh, this anime or this manga is amazing i'd love to see it in game one thing i'd like to see and the time of it would kind of work out one book series that i've loved since i was in high school back in the 90s and they're adapting it into an, a tv show like a high budget tv show on amazon kind of like game of thrones style but i think any sort of nerds who love this series will probably hate that and i actually kind of hate comparing it to to game of thrones as well is wheel of time and it's a really amazing series it's gonna have a lot of hype uh coming in the fall because it's coming out in november uh and i think it'd be really cool collab to do we've already seen real life tv show collabs with uh, stranger things i know that was kind of like mixed reception of that but i think a wheel of time collab would be super cool in my books how about you sandy you gotta you gotta have at least one or two you you're kind of hoping for probably hopefully not as boring as mine (laughs) <laughs> the otaku fever in me wants to do like anything anime, you know, Jujutsu Kaisen, Demon Slayer. But I mean, Puzzles and Dragons <laughs> were able to bid out Demon Slayer to get it in their game. And it's like Net Marvel. That was that was the one that's most popular. But I think for me, I'm a diehard, diehard Lord of the Rings fan, um, Des. <laughs> so I think that just the layout and the way that Net Marvel has done uh, for 7DS. Um, I want to see Middle Earth. Like, I want to see Middle Earth. I, I want to fight, you know, Sauron um, and maybe get the weapon, the ring that rules them all. Like, it's just, I want to walk in some Mordor. <laughs> I just think <laughs> that that is just an awesome series. Um, it was a book as well, right? Um, but yeah, it's kind of weird because you were talking about, you know, Wheel of Time coming to Amazon, but Amazon is also putting a great investment into Lord of the Rings, but that's coming out next year in September so I'll be waiting for that but you know I I want I want to see hobbits I want to see golem you know (laughs) I want to see dwarves like I think it would fit really well into the theme of 7ds I'd be so curious as to what characters they'd bring in as summonable characters because you've named like 10 just from your like you know one minute of talking and but one you didn't mention that I would hard pull on no matter what would be Gandalf if I could, I uh, Eddie, I know he'd be strong. I'd love to play 7DS with Gandalf. Oh, my goodness. Don't you get Gandalf started. the gray or Gandalf the white? <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. Maybe he'll have multiple cosmetics for, for either one. But, yeah, either way, Gandalf, just being Gandalf, uh, he's always been, you know, something ever since I was a kid reading Lord of the Rings for the first time. I uh, really loved, so. But, yeah, and also, not to mention Demon Slayer, I haven't, you, you got me to start it and I watched like two or three episodes of the, of the anime and I stopped. I got to pick that back up. It was good too. I don't remember why I stopped, but that's another one I got to pick back up again, but maybe I'll have to watch slime if we, since we know there is actually a collab coming. That's what I did with ReZero when I knew it was coming to 70 yes, I watched all of ReZero. So you have to brush up on my, uh, my slime anime before uh, the collab gets you- released. You got to watch Demon Slayer because season two is coming, guys. And who knows? Netmarble's listening. Maybe maybe we'll get a collab. <laughs> I feel like that's one of the obvious ones that's got to come. I know obviously there's like politics and negotiations required to get things to happen and things just have to kind of line up. But still, that would be a really cool one to have. Okay. Well, I think this might be a good place to end off. We ended off not going too long. I was a little bit worried we'd go over time and our, we, we'd run into time constraints at the end, but we finished all the content we wanted to. So good job us. It's probably no, but the fact that Novage wasn't here. Novage would have made this show a lot longer having three of us to talk about stuff as opposed to just two. But yeah, Novage, we miss you. Can't wait for you to have you back and hope you get better, bud, too. If, uh, always feel bad missing you on the show. 
But uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today at the Borja Tavern, the 7 Deadly Sins Grand Cross podcast. We stream the show live on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Borja Tavern, whenever we film it. And your guess is as good as ours, because who knows when we're going to have time, but we always try and make it every, every couple weeks now. Um, but yeah, so just keep an eye out for that. Subscri- if you subscribe to us there, just you know, click the bell or whatever you do on Twitch. I don't even know. It'll let you know when we go on live. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always email us anytime at Borhat, podcast at borhattavern.com or follow us on Instagram or Twitter at, at Borhat Tavern. All three of us, me, Sandy, and Novich, uh, are members of the Global Guild Denied. It's part of the Scoundrels Alliance. If you'd like to join us, join our ranks, pop over to Discord server. The link's in the description. We've got five guilds in our, in our alliance, and one of them's actually currently recruiting too. So pop in and say hi. You can also subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you happen to find your podcasts online. You can also find our shows on our website at borhattavern.com. We'd like to thank Madeline Marois for crafting our killer logo, Streetwise Rhapsody from YouTube for composing our awesome cover of the Grand Cross theme song, which we use for our intro, and Andre Bobe from ArtStation for letting us use his outstanding 3D renders of the Borhat Tavern for our pre-live and post-video splash screens. You can find all their work in the links in the description, wherever you happen to be watching or listening to this. Everybody, thanks for listening. Have a great week. Bye.